to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the wounds of the broken hearted and to tell the captives that you are free. So I tell you tonight that you are free. I'm sent as a messenger from the Lord to tell you
me free from your darkness. I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and in a time of God's recompense on his enemies, to comfort all those who are in sorrow, to strengthen those who are crushed by despair, who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful bouquet in the place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears, and the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. So we sing right now that you're good, you're good. sitting on his goodness. You're good. 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 Put off my rags and clothe me with glass. To turn my morning into dancing. Put off my rags and clothe me with glass. Oh.
You thought it was over, but we're not done. Tell him more that he's good tonight. We haven't let it all out yet. We got more on the inside, and I feel it. So let's dance and let's sing. And let's tell the Lord that he's been good to us.
Try to tell you you're slow. If they try to tell you you're a junkie, if they try to tell you that you're in recovery, you tell them who the Lord says you are. And I am who I am because the I am gave me a name. You can't tell me who I am because the I am tells me who I am.
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I know that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Because I know that your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Because I know surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Follow me all the days of my life, cause you're good. And surely your word says that your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And surely your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And follow me all the days of my life. So I'll expect it. I'll expect your goodness and your mercy to follow me all the days of my life, because you're good. And I know it, because you're good. And I know it, because you're good.
want you to think back on that moment right now. Think back on that moment where he was good to you. That moment where he sent his son on the cross. That's the moment we glean from. That's the moment that we focus on. Because we're not promised. We're not promised for him to continue it. We're promised his son on the cross. We are not in expectation of anything from God except for his son's sacrifice. We are happy with just that. But God is so good that he says even still, he is still going to bless you. He is still going to bless you because he takes pleasure in you. He takes pleasure in our smile. He takes pleasure when we take pleasure in him. He takes pleasure in our sacrifice. You're God. You're God alone from before time began. And you owe us nothing. But you want to give us everything. (laughs) You owe us nothing, nothing. But yet you lavish your goodness in our lives. You show your goodness every single moment of every single day in our lives. You're the God of the universe. You don't have to do that. And you still do because you delight in showing mercy. You delight in showing mercy. We don't deserve it, but you delight in showing mercy. You have led me, you have led me through the 
fire. In the darkest nights. In darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I've known you as a friend. So I've got to sing. So I, I will, will sing of the good. good. to heaven.
darkness you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Sing, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great.
your neighbor and tell them you're glad they're here tonight. Is it, is it cold in here? Y'all like it? A little bit? Mix, 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 mix opinions. <laughs> Great, no, uh, all right, just leave it. Hey Amen, y'all can be seated, amen. Welcome everyone. Hey amen, well y'all know that uh, announcement video we miss Sunday, we're gonna show it now. Amen. Just check it out. Good morning, LFC friends and family. Welcome to Lighthouse Freedom Center. So happy you're here with us this morning. And we declare you're going to encounter Jesus like never before. Here at Lighthouse Freedom Center, we are people knowing who they are, walking in who they are, and sharing that freedom with others. Find us on social media. Just search Lighthouse Freedom Center or LFC Church. And make sure you hit this subscribe, like, and share. Also, check out our website at www.lfcchurch.org. Church members, you are in need of volunteers to work the computer in the sound booth, as well as camera operators. When I say we're in need, we're in need. So if you're in interested in helping out, please sign up, sign up in the lobby. The Bible says the prayers of the righteous avail much. So join us for our midday intercessory prayer Monday through Friday from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Help us spread the word about our community food outreach every Thursday from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. We want to tell the people in our community how good Jesus is. We're holding our all-Spanish speaking Bible study every Thursday at 7 p.m. to so go share the news. It's time for the annual Tent Re Revival. It's full gospel tabernacle in Plant night. City <laughs> on Tuesday, April 16th at 7 p.m. Come and join us for a night of worship and testimonies and sharing what an amazing work God is doing in the faith home. Also, 
Let's lift up a shout for Pastor Elliot Cope, who's bringing the word this year. <sighs> the evangelism team will be going out this Saturday, April 20th at 10 a.m. Listen, listen, souls are being won. People are being healed. So come out and join what God is doing. Do you smell that? It smells like freedom. It's making me hungry. The Taste of Freedom food truck will be at the Winthrop Park Market on Saturday, April 20th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So come on by and have lunch with us because the lunch will be very good. Somebody shout, Faith on Graduation! Woo! Join us to celebrate Faith on Graduation of Sean and Sandra next Sunday, April 21st at 10 a.m. Never get tired of celebrating life changed by Jesus Christ. Also, there will be no kids to place kids to the Faith Home graduation. Kids will be staying in the sanctuary with your families for the celebration. Now somebody say, hey ladies! The Women of Freedom are having a potluck picnic here at LFT at Saturday, April 27th at 11 a.m. So mighty women, start getting your favorite dish ready. Down up in the lobby with what you're bringing. Ladies, that's not all. We're getting ready for the Mother's Day brunch Saturday, May 11th at 11 a.m. A theme this year is generation to generation. we we'll bring your children and grandchildren. It's only $10 per adult. Kids under 18 are free. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to sow into the kingdom of God. If you're ready to sow, sow some seed, somebody shout hallelujah! Hallelujah. He's a natural. He's a natural. <laughs> amen. He's got a future in production. Amen. Preaching. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready to receive tithes and offerings. Amen. For the church. Amen. Malachi 3.10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Improve me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I would not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He will not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. Somebody say the tither. The tither, the tither listen, uh, connects you to the blessing. Yeah. It not only connects you to the blessing, God promises to protect your assets from the devourer. Anybody ever have be saving up some money, then all of a sudden something happens to wipe out what you saved? That's the devourer. But God said when you tithe, I will rebuke that devourer that tries to come and destroy the fruits of your ground. I'll set up a divine protection around your assets. God said give me 10 and I'll do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. Amen? And listen, he says, prove me. Try me. Put me to the test and see what I'll do. You'll be surprised the miracles that begin to break forth when you begin to honor the Lord with your finances. Amen? Who's ready to honor him tonight? Amen? Amen. If you need an uh, envelope, raise your hands and the ushers will bring it to you. Amen? Don't stop tithing. Amen? Well, Pastor Tone, I've been tired and I, I haven't seen anything. He, like I said, he's been protecting you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. As you have ready, you can stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Let's lift it up to the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you that I'm blessed. I'm protected. I'm wealthy. I'm healthy for the rest of of my life. Come forward, let's get Victory is mine before my eyes can see it. No, there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. No, I won't be moved. My hopes in you this life breaks through the darkness. No, there's nothing that
Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we praise you. We thank you for these uh, the seeds that represent the faith of your people. Father, we bless this seed. We declare that it comes back into their lives. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, Father God, shall men give back into their bosom. Father, we thank you that it will be used here in the lighthouse to expand the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for it now in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. All right, you guys can sit down. You know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, so <laughs> that's just uh, that's the way the Lord made me. Amen. Let's get into a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you, Father, tonight, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are going to speak through me, Father. Father, we pray, Lord God, that, Father, there is a word, Father, for each and every one of us, Father, tonight. Father, a prophetic word, Father, a rhema word, Father, a, for a word, Lord God, that would change the lives of the people, Father, that they will not, Father God, leave the same the way they came in, Father. Father, we thank you, Lord, that they will be engrafted into their hearts, Father, I yield, Father, my heart, my mind, and my tongue, Father. Use it as a ready writer, Father, to write into the hearts of those that listen to the words that I speak, Father. We thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in advance, Father. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Already seated already. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know, I, uh, I had a different word that I was uh, studying. But I realized that that word was for me uh, specifically. So, you know, then the Lord switched it. And as I, the more I began into prayer, the Lord began to minister to me about a specific word. So I didn't want to mix what the Lord was telling me specifically to what the, the Lord wanted to speak to the church. You know, and, uh, and um, I think within this year, I think about the end of the last year, we, we went through um, changes and even when I came into the to into the faith home, you know, uh, as a supervisor over the faith home, there was a transition. And I want to speak tonight about transition. And the word the Lord gave me was crossover. Crossing over. Crossing over. One of the things the Lord started to minister to me about was is that uh, even when the Israelites came out of Egypt, there were, there were many that never crossed over into the promised land. That many had been delivered, but they never entered the promise. They never came into the place of where the promise of God was. They got the deliverance, and they got the salvation, but they never entered into the promise. So they stopped short of where God the complete work, what God wanted to do into their lives. And I, and I started to realize that many in the church today, what's happening is, is that many only just go to the part of the deliverance part and only go to the part of the salvation, but never enter into the promised land, never enter to the place of abundance, the place of provision, the place where God is operating in them and that they're flowing in milk and honey. Now, the flowing is a continual thing. It's not just a one-time thing. It's a continual thing. So uh, the people in uh, Israel, when they were 
they came through and they were supposed to go into the promised land, they got stuck. So many in the church get stuck like Chuck. They get stuck in the pews, they get stuck, and they never transfer into the, and transition over and cross over to the full promise of what God wants for them in their lives. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Full restoration, everything walking in the calling of God in their lives and walking in what God wants, the restoration of their family, their family coming to the Lord, their sons and their, their daughters being restored back to them, walking into the promise, walking into everything that God has for them. I don't know about you, but I want everything. I want everything that God has for me. I don't want to get into heaven and find out that God had a lot for me, but I got stuck like Chuck in my own mindset and never crossed over to what God wanted me to enter into. I never got the full promise of what God wanted. I don't want to get into the kingdom of God and find out that God had this for me, but because my own stubborn thinking or my own unbelief, I couldn't enter in because I almost felt like I was either unworthy. And so I wanted the three things that I wanted to show you tonight about three areas that will stop you from coming into the promised land. But I'm not going to leave you there. I'm also going to tell you the three things that can help you to enter into the promised land. It's a crossing over, a transition. A transition is the prom is a process of a period of change from one state to another. It's a transition. It's that you, you, even, even you shouldn't even be looking the same as you were last year. If you're still stuck in the same mindset of last year or even six months ago or even a month ago, there's something that you haven't given up to, to, to get what God has for you. Because in this trans transition, there's always something that has to be exchanged. There has to be an exchange. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, there was an exchange. His death we brought resurrection, and out of that came the people, came the people that the Lord brought to him. So there was an exchange. His death and his resurrection brought us into the Lord, brought us into the kingdom. So there was an exchange. There's always an exchange. Now, what you will have to look at tonight is that what is God telling you to let go? What has God been dealing with you to let go that you've been stagnant for months and you haven't been able to cross over to a new level in him because you've been stuck like Chuck with a mind frame and thinking to yourself that you don't want to let it go? One of the things that I realize is that, you know, what happens is, is that a lot of times when we don't want to let go of something, it's because we think it's either beneficial to us or it's something that we can use later on or it's something that is uncomfortable to let go of. You know, in the, in the, in the Africans have this way of catching a monkey. You know how they catch a monkey? It's they make a hole in a in a in a in a in a wall, right? They make a hole in a wall and they put a piece of fruit in that in that wall. So the monkey comes and smells smells the fruit and sticks his hand in that hole trying to get the fruit out. But the problem is, is that it ends up being a trap because they stick their hand in there, but because they got a hold of the fruit, they can't get their hand out. So their hand gets stuck. Not realizing that the way to get escaped and to be free is they have to let go of the fruit and be able to pull their hand right back out. All they need to do is let go. But the monkey is so stubborn that the monkey will not let go and he ends up getting captured because he won't let go of the fruit. He wants to keep holding on to it and doesn't realize that his freedom, it comes from him letting go. So I want to ask you tonight, what fruits are you holding on to? 
What fruits are you holding on to? Now you have the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh. So I ask you tonight, what fruits are you holding on to? That God has been telling you to let go, but you don't want to let go. Go over to me to Hebrews 12.1. As for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into that we'll be able to run full life's marathon's race with passion and determination for the path has been already marked out for us. There's already path already made for us, but apparently there are stakes that keep holding you back. So he says you have to let go of those things that hold you back. And a lot of times what happens is, is that we don't want to let go of the victim mentality because it's sort of like a, a security blanket to hold on to as an excuse not to move forward. We need to hold on to something so that if we don't make it, we can always fall back to the excuse that we were abused as a child. And that's the reason why we can't move forward. And it's not just that, but it's the very thing that we struggle with that the God is telling us it's time to let that go. It's time to let those things that have hindered you all your life, you keep going through round and round and round and round like the children of Israel were stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. They couldn't break it, and they got stuck like Chuck in the wilderness, and they could never cross over. They can never go into the other side because in their mind frame, they were still thinking that they were still that slave mentality that they had in their mind, and they couldn't let that go. They couldn't let that go. They couldn't release it. They couldn't say, you know what? God has a lot more for me. I need to let go of that way of thinking of the way I thought when I was a slave and to think that the enemy's provisions were enough for me that maybe this is not worth it. This is not, this is not worth me going through this. For maybe it was better back then than it is now, so I'm not going to go ahead and press forward. I'm going to stay here like Chuck, stay here like Chuck and stay here and not move on to the next level in the Lord. So you have to let go in order for you to enter in. In an elevator, we talk about elevation. In order to go to the fifth floor, we have to leave the fourth floor. You will not go to the fifth floor unless you leave the fourth floor. Unless your mind begins to elevate in his way of thinking and his way of knowing that what God has for you is better than, than where you're at now, that he has a lot more for you than what you're experiencing. You see, because there's always more in the Lord than what you deserve. It's always faith to faith and glory to glory. You can't, get, you can't come into a mind frame that you already learned, you already arrived. If you don't love correction, you do not love the Word. The reason is because the Word is correction. The Word is correction. It is for reproof and correction. The whole thing about your whole entire Christian walk is based on you becoming better than you were yesterday. So you have to get into a mind frame that you want to be better than you were. But there's always an exchange. And this is the issue that many of us have is that we don't want to give up anything else. So we want to be comfortable in where we're at because we know that there is something that we want to give up and it's going to be uncomfortable. We get comfortable in our Christian walk. We get comfortable at where we're at. We get comfortable in the revelation of yesterday, and we repeat the same revelation that we got last year, and we're still running around with last year's revelation. 
And we haven't even digged into the Word of God to find out what else is he trying to tell us. So we get stuck. We get stuck like Chuck. And we never get into the next level. So I believe the Lord is, it wants us to cross over and to the other side. To cross over to the promises of God. There are promises, there are ministries, there are purposes. There is God's will for your life that he has for you, and you've been stuck like Chuck since last year, and you haven't progressed anything else because the very thing that he's been telling you to give up, you will not give up. You want to hold on to it. You want to hold on to the mindset. But listen to what happened to the, 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 when God spoke to Moses. Thank you. I got too much stuff over here. Amen. Go over to me to Exodus 33, 1, 3. And it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thee, Unto thy seed I will, will I give it. So he's a, and, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Persites, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and all the ites. I, 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 I. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what they were thinking because that fear was setting in when they started hearing about all the ites. So he says, unto land flowing with milk and honey, for now will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in their way. So he's telling them, I want you to go into the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you because you, they're stubborn. They're stiff-necked. That word stiff-necked is stubborn. So one of the things that keeps, keeps people from going into the promised land is that they're stubborn. What is stubborn? Stubbornness is a way of thinking that it will not change. That no matter how much reason, you can tell them it's red, but they believe it's blue. So no matter what, you try to change them, and you can bring all the evidence to show that this is the way, and they won't change. They already have it in their mind, and they will not change their mind. They have a stubbornness with them. They're like mules trying to direct them one way, and they still want to go the other way. They still want to jump off the cliff, even though you're trying to tell them there's a cliff there. Don't go that way because you're going to end up falling off, and they still want to go that way. They're stubborn in their thinking. Here is God saying, listen, I want to take you into the promised land, but the problem is, is that you're hard-headed, you're stiff-necked, you, you won't receive from me, and I'm trying to tell you that this is the way, all the way I took you out and I delivered you, but you forgot all that, and now you think you got it all together, and now you want to come up with your own plan, and you do not want to receive. You get to a place that you don't want to receive anymore. You get to a place that, that, that stiff neck is that you got, you're looking at one way, and no matter what, what anybody tries to tell you, they cannot convince you. So that's one of the things that keeps you from coming into the promised land because God is trying to show you something, but you already got your mind made up, and you will not change your mind. One of the things that really, really is, gets to a point when you try to minister to people and no matter what they tell you, they will not receive. Once you get to a point 
that you will not receive and you shut yourself down. Glory! Glory, glory, glory. We still got power up in this house. We got power! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise you, Lord God. I think the enemy, did, the enemy didn't want you to hear that. The enemy didn't want you to hear that. Amen. I think that hit somewhere. So, amen. We're going to continue. Amen. Even with a good argument, it's difficult to change a person's mind because their refusal to learn. Like I said, if you do not love correction, you do not love the Word of God because the Word of God comes to correct. And if you're not willing to adjust your way of thinking and you're stuck in the way you're thinking, what happens is, is that you stay, in the, you stay in the wilderness of your own mind, going over and over and over and over and over. They were 11 days out from getting into the promised land, and it took them 40 years. 11 days. I've seen those that are right there at the edge of the blessing and blow it at the last moment. Just when God's getting ready to restore them, I've gotten packages. And all of it, I'm going like, this guy was supposed to get this package, and he left before his time. The second is complainers. Those that are never satisfied, those that are never satisfied, no matter what, they never satisfied. They could see the blessings of God, and it's never enough. They could see them. They could get blessed with so many things. God moves into their life. They get restored back to their family, and it's still not enough. They complain about everything. They complain about every little thing, everything. Every, you know why? It's because they're already looking for an excuse. So they're looking to do the blame game. You know what the blame game is? You never take full responsibility. You never say, it's me, it's me, oh, Lord. It's me, I'm the one. You got to get to a point in your walk where you said, I have to do it. It's, it's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not the one that abused me. It's not when I was locked up. It's none of that stuff. It's me, Lord. I have to change. So you look for the little mistakes here and there to justify as an excuse to not take the responsibility. And you never take responsibility. You always walk in your life and you never take ownership for your own mistakes. And so you never correct it because if it's somebody else's fault and then they have to correct it. Well, when you take ownership, you say, okay, Lord, what adjustments do I need to take? What adjustments do I need to do? But if I put it on somebody else, now I'm waiting on somebody else to make their adjustment. And I never make any kind of adjustment. Complainers. Complainers never satisfy. Always to look at the negative. A negative side of things. Ungrateful attitude. Exodus 15, 15. Amen. I'm taking it old school. Get him collected. Amen. There it is. 
Amen, amen. Thank you. You know what I got blessed with today? My beautiful wife laid hands on me and prayed for me today. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Because there were times that I always prayed for her. But to have her lay hands on me and pray for me, that's a blessing. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in, in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, but they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So here is the people, they're murmuring, and they're blaming Moses. Because sometimes what happens is, is that we get to this place that we always, always want other people to fix our problems. We come to a place of always going up for prayer to fix it when God's already given you the tool and God has already given you the way out. But we don't want to apply that because it's too hard because now we got to apply the word. But it's much more easier to come up for prayer and have somebody do this osmosis thing, this satara and everything just gets fixed. Abracadabra. And everything is just fixed when it's something that you need to fix. It's your attitude. It's you complaining. It's your way of perception. You have to own it. Faith does not work. When you come up here for prayer, I'm coming to agreement with you. But if you don't agree with me, it don't work. I can pray for you all day long, and it won't work because you're not applying your faith. Where two come together touching anything on earth, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. You have to come into agreement. When you come to for prayer for healing, you got to believe you're healed. That's the way it works. It can't be this thing where other people are carrying you and you don't apply nothing and you're just waiting for this magic touch and you don't do nothing and you do the same thing over and over again and complain about why it doesn't change. Complainers. This is the thing that the Lord got upset with. And the reason was is because they saw miracles, right? They saw the Red Sea departed. They got out of there with gold. They got out of there blessed. They got out of there with food. They got out of there with everything that they needed. And they still wasn't enough. So that shows me that you can have an encounter and it still be bitter and complaining. You can see the miracle and still reject God. This is what upset God. Because he said, everything I did for you, I took you out of Egypt. I took you out of darkness into the promised land. And you're still not grateful. It was the ungrateful attitude. The ungrateful attitude will keep you out of the kingdom, keep you out of the promised land. The third thing was unbelief. Unbelief. It was their identity, the way they saw themselves. The way they saw themselves that they could not break the way they saw themselves. They kept seeing themselves the way they were. Go to Numbers 13, 33. And they saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were, so we were in their sight. 
So it was the unbelief and, and their own way that they saw themselves that they thought they couldn't receive the blessing or they couldn't come into the promised land because in their own mindset, they thought that they were the same person they were before they got into the kingdom of God. So they, couldn't, they didn't know their own identity. They had unbelief about the change that God did in their life, and they kept thinking that they were the same person that they were before they came to the Lord. So many of you still think that God can't do it because you, you, you're thinking that you're still the same old and God hasn't changed you. So whenever you're confronted with a difficult situation, you think you can't overcome it because you think you're the same person and you don't realize that God has given you the authority within you. You don't realize the authority that God has given in you. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you are, so you have unbelief. You don't believe the change that God has done. You don't believe that God has changed you, and you think you're the same person you were. That unbelief keeps you out. It keeps you out because in your mindset, you believe you don't deserve it. You believe that you don't deserve the promise. You believe that you don't deserve the restoration of your family because you think that you're still the person that you were before. But the circumstances, even though it hasn't manifested yet, God says you are a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But unless you change the way you see yourself, the way your mind thinks of who you are and your true identity, you will not have the confidence to walk in it. Because it's, whatsoever a man think of it is hard, so is he. You believe that you are, so you act that way. If I'm a man of God, I act like a man of God. I think like a man of God. I talk like a man of God because I know that that's my identity. I am a man of God. But because you don't think you're a man of God, you don't think you deserve the things that a man of God deserves. So the third thing that keeps you from coming into the promised land it's your mindset, your unbelief on your identity. So you have to change the way you see yourself. You have to change the way, the way you begin to see yourself and the way God made you. Now, we're gonna, one of the things that helps you get into the promised land is we go to Exodus 13, 21. Faith. These are the three things you're going to need. Faith. And the Lord went, went before them by day in, in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. You're going to have to have faith for provision, direction, and protection. On the way to the promised land, you're going to have to believe that God is going to protect you. God is going to guide you, and he's going to lead you, and he's going to provide everything you need to get to the promised land. So your faith is going to need to be applied. You're going to have to know, listen, if he provided the cloud by day and the pillar by night, he was already showing you. You got here, and some of you, I don't, you don't even believe how you even got here. Some of you experienced uh, close to death, overdoses, locked up in jail, and all of a sudden you got released. Times where you should have got shot, overdose, and you made it here. God was already providing the pillar by night, the pillar, the cloud by day, and the pillar by night. So if you start to look back to what God has done you start to realize that if he was there before when you didn't even want nothing to do with him, how much more now that you're trying to do what's right, he's not going to work in your life. One of the tricks of the enemy is to make you think 
that he's not doing nothing in your life, that he's forgot you, that now that he brought you here, he left you. This was the mindset of the Israelites. They said, you brought us all out here to die. You brought us to the faith home to go through all this. You forgot the way you was when you came in here. I'm going to need to show some of your intake photos. With your long beards and scrappy hair, your clothes dirty. And maybe you need to remember what God has done. One of the ways that you help your faith is you remember. You remember. You go in there, you say, listen, you start to think, man, I was jacked up. You start to think of it in the praise and worship. I tell you, sometimes I'm crying back there, and I'm thinking, man, what God has done in my life. And that alone gets me a little more seat time. I'm thinking I can move some mountains up in here. That I know I was a mountain. I myself was a mountain. And somebody spoke in my life and said, you're not going to be the same. God is going to change your life. You need to remember where God brought you from. You want to build your faith up. You're going through an unbelief or, or faith struggle. Start to think about what God has done already. You see, they want to remember that when they were in the wilderness. They said, man, he parted the Red Sea. That was impossible. That was a wall. And God moved Red Seas in your life. And you start to look at the Red Seas. Some way, somehow, God brought you here. Faith. You're going to need faith. The second thing is a relationship. This is one of the main keys that I tell you something. Listen, you want to get the promised land, you want to get the blessings and all that. That's good. But the main thing you want to get out of this thing is relationship. You want to get, that's actually the promised land. The promised land is in the relationship. Because in that relationship is the presence of God. And where the presence of God is, there's nothing lacking, nothing missing. You don't need to ask for nothing. All you need to go is just go into the presence and everything else just starts coming to you. Seek ye first. And all of a sudden, when that dirty thing, you're thinking about him. And he starts showing up with your family, showing up with a wife, showing up with the blessing, showing up with a car, showing up with a house, showing up with the very child that you've been praying for, shows up. And the back of this, and the back of this church walks in here. And I keep saying again and again, seek ye first. Take care of his kingdom, and he'll take care of you. This is the word the Lord gave me. He said, take care of my people, and I'll take care of you. And the next day, my wife got healed. Some of you need to start thinking about giving instead of receiving. Some of you need to start thinking about what I need to do. To what, what, do, what do I have to give, Lord? Instead of what you can give me, Lord, instead of getting a oh, Lord, I need this and I need that. No. What, well, Lord, what do you need? There needs to be an exchange. Exchange. Don't ask him what you, what you want. Ask him what he, you can give him. Relationship. Listen, I always say this to the brothers. Listen, you could do all the right things here. And you can modify your behavior. But there's going to come a time in your life when nobody's watching. What are you going to do then? It's only your relationship that will sustain you. It's only the power of the Holy Spirit telling you, no, don't do that. Stay away from him. Don't go there. Don't do this. Don't say that. Don't watch this. Don't look at that. It's only your relationship that's going to sustain you. The promised land. 
Joshua 1.8. Sorry, go to 1.6 first. Joshua 1.6. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says here. Listen to these three things that he says and repeats it over and over again. Be strong and of good courage, for unto these people shalt that divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto thy fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Thou, thou mayest prosper whithersoever you goest. Once again, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee to command? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Three times he says, be strong and of good courage. The third thing you're going to need is a no-quit spirit. You're going to need a spirit that says, Come hell or high water, I ain't moving. I'm going to be strong and of good courage, and I'm going to endure this, and I'm going to keep on going. You're going to need to, whenever you go through a situation, you're going to need to settle within your heart and say, listen, I ain't going back. I'm not turning back. I'm not putting my hand upon the plow. I ain't going back. Come hell or high water, I'm staying right here, right where God wants me to be. A no-quit spirit. The true lion of the tribe of Judah. The true lion. That roar within your spirit that says, you know what? This situation is going on, but you know what? I'm going to take off my shoes. I'm going to take off my button, my shirt, and we're going to go to war. You did it out in the world. Some of you are so brave. What? What are you talking to? That's the same way you need to fight. That's the same way. Whenever you face situations, you're going to need to have to get off instead of this sorrowful and backful. Oh, Lord, help me. Man, no. I didn't do that. I don't know about you, but I wasn't talking that way in the streets. I was like, what? Matter of fact, I used to, I used to challenge the bigger guy. I guess it was called, you know, I was like, yeah, you think you can't fight because I'm short? I said, you know what? Pastor Rachel got my back. She knows what I'm talking about. (laughs) You know, because sometimes the enemy enemy thinks that you're not all that. Sometimes when you hit through a situation, you need to show them who you really are. Don't Don't worry about what you look like or don't worry about what people think about you. You need to know who you are. This is why it's important that you know who you are so you step into it whenever you go through a battle. If you change your mindset, you see the, it was all they needed to do was to change the way they were thinking, to change their mindset. It was all in their mind. All the time, they thought that it was far away. And some of you think that the promise that God has said to you is far away, but it might just be around the corner. But you need to cross over in your mind and know what God has called you to. He didn't take you this far to drop you off. If he loved you back then, how much more would he not bless you now that you're doing what's right? He's not going to he's not going to take you out of Egypt or to leave us and they complain about the water, they complain about the food, they complain with all of them. All the time they needed 
You know what happens to water when it's in one area for a long time? That's why you have to stir yourself up. That's why you have to stir up the waters, the living waters inside you. That's why you got to stir yourself up. Because you have to stir yourself up. You have to stir yourself up in the Lord. And you can, some of you, some of you, some of you can't even, it's, this is one, this is a trick. Because some of you can't even smell yourself. Some of you don't even realize that you don't smell good. <laughs> And you think that you do, and you do not. <laughs> you know what happens after a while? You, you don't take a shower. You think that's your normal order. And you think that that's just the way you are because you don't take a bath, so you don't know the difference. It's in order for you to know the difference, and you need to take a shower, and you can tell yourself. When you start getting in the Word, and you start praying, and you start seeking the Lord, you can tell the difference when you're not seeking the Lord. Something's off. That's why you can't tell the difference. Because you're not seeking the Lord, you don't know what it feels like to not seek the Lord. There's nothing shaking in your stomach, and your belly telling you, hey, you're off, man. When's the last time you when's the last time you prayed? Where's the last time you sought me? Where's the last time you opened up the word? You see, this is why we cannot get to a you cannot have a gimme gimme generation. A gimme gimme generation is always seeking for others to give to them, but they never give out. They never give out. They always want to take. They always want to take. They always want to take. They want to take from the minister. They want to take from Bishop. They want to take from Pastor Rachel, Pastor Elliot. They want to take. They want to take, take, take. And then when they say, all right, what you going to give? Man, I ain't got nothing. Why? Because you never look for yourself to have anything for yourself. Everything is off of somebody else's revelation. But where is your revelation? It's because the light of the word hasn't illuminated to you to see. So you're always looking at the eyes of another person, but you can't see because you're not using your own eyes to see. So the light comes in to show you, and that revelation becomes engrafted into your heart, and you take it and you receive it. And you know, listen, that becomes an experience. That becomes something that whenever you need it, it's right there for you. But if you're always grabbing from the different trees and you eat it and you throw away the the banana peel or throw away the apple and it's all gone and it doesn't stay, it doesn't sustain yourself because it's only momentary. This is why he he gave the manna didn't last. The manna didn't last because it was only, you can't live on yesterday's revelation. You cannot live on yesterday's revelation. You live in a last year's word, but you haven't gotten a word this year. And God is saying it's time for you to cross over. It's time for you to cross over. It's time for you to cross over your thinking. It's time to cross over. What are you willing? What is God asking from you? You know what God has been asking you from. You know what God has been dealing with you with and telling you, give this up. I want to move in your life, but you need to give an exchange. You need to give this up. You need to have a transfer. There has to be a transition because you can't carry out the old into the new. You can't bring the old into the new. You can't put the old into new wineskins. The wineskin will burst. You won't be able to contain the wine and the word of God in your life because it will break because there's nothing sustainable. There's nothing that will keep it. You don't have anything to sustain it. So in order for you, you need to put it into a wineskin, a new wineskin. And God is saying, listen, enough is enough. I want to transfer you into the new level of thinking. I want to elevate you this year. But you got to get off the bottom floor, and you need to go up. You need to stop staying in that bottom level, and you need to come up. 
You need to come up in your thinking. You need to come up in your faith. Some of you are afraid to believe God because you're afraid to be discouraged. You're afraid to believe and it may not happen. I'd rather not believe because if I believe and it don't, doesn't happen, that hurts too much. So I'd rather not believe. And the Lord is saying, listen, son, if I brought you, listen, daughter, if I brought you this far, it's because I want the whole thing, nothing missing, nothing lacking. That very sudden daughter that you've been believing God for, for restoration, I need you to wake up every single morning and say, Father God, I thank you that my daughter, I thank you that my son has returned back to me. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, for the restoration of all things, Lord. You know the exchange of, you know what prayer is? Prayer is the exchange of time. Time is money, right? So the exchange of prayer is your time in prayer. You taking your time and you saying, okay, Lord, I was going to use this time to do this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go play basketball. I'm not going to go scroll through Facebook. I'm not going to look at the Netflix. I'm going to take this time instead, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it in prayer. I'm going to take I'm going to give an exchange by using this time and making a transfer in to the spirit with prayer. This is what fasting is. Fasting is an exchange, an uncomfortability. I feel comfortable eating, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to push the plate aside and make an exchange of what I want to eat, and I'm going to fast this time. I'm going to push the plate aside. I'm going to make an exchange. In order to get to the next place, there has to be a sacrifice. A seed. Bobby gave me a plant. And he didn't realize I was going to use it tonight as a metaphor. See, what happened was is that he got this plant. And out of the basil, the seed was still wet. So he planted the seed and nothing grew. It wasn't until the seed shriveled up and died before it started springing up. There are certain things that need to die before you see the fruit of. There are certain things in your life that you're going to need to sacrifice and die. Say, you know what? I'm going to die to my own self. I'm going to die to what I want. You see, also, also, obedience it's a sacrifice of your own will. This is the exchange. This is the other exchange. You are sacrificing your will by being obedient. And God is saying tonight, listen, I've been wanting you to be obedient, but you won't make the exchange because you won't exchange your will with my will. And God is saying tonight, listen, I've been telling you to do this, and you won't do it, and that why, that's why you haven't seen any change and you haven't gone into the next level with me because I've been telling you to exchange your obedience for my obedience. And once you do that, you say, Lord, my, your will and not my will. This was the God of Gethsemane. This was the exchange of Jesus Christ when he prayed and he said, not my will, your will. Deliverance started in the Garden of Gethsemane when God, when Jesus exchanged his will with God's will. Obedience is the ultimate exchange because that requires surrender. That requires you giving up, you saying, not my will, your will. When you get to that place in the Lord and you say, Lord, that's it. And some of you need to be broken in order to get there. And the Lord, when he has a plan for your life, he will break you. He will break you. He will break you. He will get you to the point. He will get you to the point that you're going to want to quit. And something inside you says you ain't quitting. 
You got to get to the point where you said, this is too much. I can't take this no more. Whatever you want, Lord. I give up. I don't want nothing but you. And in that point when he breaks your will, that's why some of you have gone through what you've gone through. Because he needed to break you. He needed to break your will. He needed you to get to a point where you said, okay, Lord, you got me. He got you to say, uncle. I give up. Let me tell you something. When God has a mark on you, you can run, but you cannot hide. When God has a mark on you, I don't care where you run to. Then he will find you right there. Ask Jonah. He tried to run, and the belly of the fish spit him out. But here's the thing, that Jesus Christ turned around, and he said, just like the belly of the fish that Jonah was spit out, so shall be the Son of God, and after three days he shall arise. So he used it. So God will use your breaking. God will use your death. When you die to yourself, when you die on the cross, when you die to what you want, and certain things are not going to be resurrected until you die. Certain things are not going to come to life. Certain things that you're not going to see until you die to yourself. Until you die to your wants. Until you die to your desires. Because God wants to use it. Because you realize that whatever is buried comes back to life. But it brings more more fruit. It brings up more fruit. There's more fruit out of it. And out of that fruit, he wants to take your life and give that fruit to other people. And feed other people. Because it's a lot bigger than you. You need to stop being selfish and realize that God wants to use you. God wants to use your life. Some of you have stayed outside and watching other people eat the fruit. But it's time for you to partake. It's time for you to partake because that's what happened to Moses. Don't let your frustration blow it. Moses got frustrated and struck the, the rock twice. He got frustrated and he said, you know what, man, I can't take this no more. And he took the stick and he hit the rock twice and he messed up the whole illustration because Jesus Christ can, wasn't supposed to die twice. So hitting the rock messed up the whole re uh, revelation. He was supposed to speak to the rock. Some of you are supposed to speak to the rock, but instead out of your full frustration, you hit the rock and you, can, you haven't entered in. But here's the thing, that he brought Moses up to the mountain and let him see what the promised land looked like. I don't want to just see it from far away. I want to enter into the promised land. I want the whole thing. I want everything that God has for me. I don't want just to receive some of it. I want everything. I don't want to stay on the outside looking in. I don't want to stay in the outer court. I want to go behind the veil and see what God is saying. I don't want to just listen to sermons. I want to get a sermon myself. I want to see what God's telling me. I want to see what God has to tell me. I don't want just to listen to other people. I'm on my own relationship. I don't want to depend on somebody else and figure out what is God saying. Let me go here. What's God saying, Bishop? You know? I want what God is telling me that when Bishop preaches, it's the same thing. And I know, okay, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. That's God saying it because he said it to Bishop. So therefore, it's the same spirit. There's not 3,000 spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. And he's saying the Holy Spirit that speaks to Pastor Elliot can speak to the new brother that just came in the other day. As one spirit, you get into your word and you listen to what God is saying. So when you come in here and you hear what Bishop says or any speaker, you say, okay, Lord, that was you. How else are you going to know unless you don't go yourself? How do you know it's the Lord? Well, your relationship. 
It will just confirm it. And you know that you're in the right place at the right time. That's how you know. How do I know I'm supposed to be here? Because the word of the Lord came to me, and he says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. By the time I got to the front of the faithful, another brother came to me, and he said, Ben, I got a word. The Lord said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The same thing confirmed that I was supposed to be here. So I knew it was the Lord. There is no confusion. There is no doubt. There is no questioning because my relationship confirms what God is saying. You want direction? Get a relationship. That's where it is. It all stems down. You cannot do one day and stop at the next. Whatever you do today, whatever you're doing today in the faith home or whatever you're receiving now, you have to do it for the rest of your life. It doesn't stop. This is just a model. This is just a model. Let me tell you something. Where I came from, I ran after the devil real hard. Now, I didn't know half stepping. I was either all the way in or all the way out. I was no lukewarm. I'm sorry, but I couldn't do that. I'm not no, I don't like doing that. I never liked fake, so I couldn't be fake. If I wasn't going to serve the Lord, I wasn't going to serve the Lord. But when I said, I'm going to come to the Lord, I said, okay, that's it. It's all over. Whatever I got to do, I got to do anything that wasn't right. I was like, Lord, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Because I knew, listen, if I'm going to go all the way, I'm going to go all the way. I ain't half-stepping this. I wasn't half-stepping with the devil. You think I'm going to half-step with God? I'm more worried about God than the devil. Some of you are more worried about the devil than God. Some of you fear more the devil than you fear the Lord. If you really feel the Lord, fear the Lord, you wouldn't do half the stuff. You know why the conviction of losing your relationship or losing his presence in your life will convict you. And you begin to see how good he is in your life and the conversations that you had. When you fall in love with somebody, you want to be with them all the time. You're always looking for them. They're like, oh, man, thank you. for just You're just thanking just to be around. When you're married and you love somebody, you want to be around them. You want to talk to them. You want to spend time with them. You spend 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning talking on the phone. Yeah, what are we talking about? Falling half asleep. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And once you receive that, you will understand that because that will be more important than anything else that you would do in your life. The presence in your relationship will be more valuable than anything you can ever do. And you won't give it up for nobody or no thing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all been blessed. One of the most amazing stories, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, deliverance at the Red Sea, the wilderness, the promised land. Where are you tonight? Are you at the Red Sea? You should be out of Egypt because you wouldn't be here if you were still in Egypt. So we know that's done, amen? But where are you at? Are you in the wilderness? Are you still stuck at the Red Sea? Or are you about to cross over into the promised land? Who's ready to cross over? Amen. Stand to your feet. Amen. Great word. Thank you, Pastor Ben. Amen. Declare this. Say, Lord, thank you that I am delivered. I am set free from Egypt. And now I lay hold of your promise, the land that flows with milk and honey. The place of nothing missing, nothing broken, it's mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys, amen. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for transition. We thank you for always moving us, Father God, from faith to faith in glory to glory. In you we live and move and have our being. And, Father, we praise you for that right now. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. Be blessed, church. Jesus.